Hello everyone, this is Razvan Gavrilas from Cognitive SEO and today we have David Harry, an old school SEO. David is a senior consultant with Verb Development and many of you know you know him from uh, SEO Training Dojo. Uh, I'll let uh, David tell you more about him. Uh, and we'll uh, be talking today about uh, old school SEOs, and uh, new school SEOs, cookie cutter, all this, all this stuff. David. Oh, good to be here, brother. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, in my twentieth year now. I started in 1998. You know, back when we used to sit around doing HTML on napkins and stuff, and uh, before Google existed. You know, we we had there wasn't even forums. There was news groups, and and you had a zillion search engines you know <laughs> it was Lycos and Hotbot and all this other stuff you know today everyone's just kind of it's all Google or nothing really and even Bing's kind of doesn't matter so yeah it's 20 years in as of this year and uh, spent some time in about five years doing forensic SEO which is kind of helping people with problems penalties and things of that nature but yes yeah, been there done that seen it <laughs> um, you know I've been tell, studying tell our, our listeners about forensic SEO many of them probably don't know the term so yeah you know I think it's a I think it's really kind of a term we made up at the time <laughs> you know um, but essentially, it's dealing with lost traffic, you know, um, and it still happens today. A lot of people, you know, they see losses in traffic and, and they jump the gun and say, well, well Penguin or Panda or, or we got a penalty or, you know, it could be so many things, you know. We, and, and what we find a lot of times when we, we do forensic work, uh, trying to figure things out, is it's often a... a, a different things a, a myriad of things you know what i mean um you if you're not having a de your developer team keeping change logs a developer can go in your hosting company could make a change to their php they could up change uh, update php and or mysql or something which can affect your site that you didn't know about um so yeah forensics is essentially um it's like uh, sherlock holmes used to say um once you've eliminated what it can't be you know whatever remains must be the truth and it's that process of figuring out okay it's not this it's not that it's not this you know but yeah you 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 find it, especially when you get larger corporate situations where you have seo teams and larger development teams you know one seo makes some title tank changes a, a dev, one of the dev guys goes and changes url on a page or something you can have a a a, 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 a uh, an effect of, of many different things that start to cause a problem. So in forensic SEO, your job is to come in and essentially try to establish why there's losses. What has happened here? Because everyone usually has that knee-jerk reaction. Oh, I got hit by Panda. I got hit by Penguin or something like that. And so many times it's not. You know what I mean? You can't just assume what the, what made you know the loss in organic traffic happen. So you have to kind of take it apart piece by piece and talk to all the people involved and try and figure out what happened. And sometimes Google makes changes. You know, Google yeah. will make changes to some query spaces and not to others, right? And and that happens. You know? So forensics is essentially the, that that process. You about being a consultant that comes in to take apart losses and figure out what happened so you can recover them. You know? Okay. Since you've been in uh, in the space for so so many years, you were saying over twenty years. Um, how do you see the changes that Google uh, has been doing uh, lately compared to what, uh, how, how, how proactive they were? I don't know, maybe seven, years eight ago. years ago. Yeah, it was about ten years ago, two thousand and eight, nine, and ten area. That that's when we started seeing. You know them hammering hard on on links and penalties and that's when manual actions came in and then you know around 2011 we started getting the pandas and the penguins and that was a very aggressive period for google when they were really you know more aggressive as far as you know spam detection and spam kind of issues went because before that obviously everyone knows you you could really spam the heck out of them and it worked you know what i mean you know there was art remember article directories and all that stuff you know you used to be able to beat the heck out of google with that and and so they had that period to 10 years to eight years ago where they, they really broke down on that um then around you know 2013 to 2016 was when they started to focus more i guess on 
you know, their own search quality, right? Um, that's when you started seeing things like Hummingbird, right? And and things which is um, query classification and how they were dealing with queries. Because, you know, around that time you had places like eHow. And eHow would answer, have like a zillion posts on how to fix a tire, how to change a tire, how to replace a tire, right? And they'd have four of these, things, these kind of articles worded differently that really were essentially the same thing. But you could rank for each of them because Google pre hummingbird wasn't really as um intuitive on on query classifications and what hummingbird and, and later on rank brain and stuff like that what they're tending to do with that is is lump those things together you know what i mean start to associate that auto means car means you know vehicle means this and that and and so that same example with how to change a tire, how to fix a tire, how to replace a tire becomes one classification for a query. And I think that's a, that was a huge change for Google. And, and that is good for you know a lot of us because you can write articles and create content that will satisfy multiple queries now where you, you really couldn't do that. You had to actually create very specific pages for, for, for different queries. So, you know, that, that evolution, I think, is, is playing out now still today. And obviously, you know, you got mobile and you've got the mobile first index that started coming out February 18th, I believe, is when they, they started doing that this year. And obviously, the HTTPS thing will be fully rolled out by July this year. Um, you know, we've had schema markup. You know what I mean? You Google My Business started to evolve even more. And, you know, it's an amazing uh, bunch of changes. You know, it's, it's funny. One of, one of my clients the other day, you know, she was relating some article she'd read, Search Engine Land or somewhere, and she's like, well, Google keeps your business at least, Dave, <laughs> because they're always changing something, so you've always got work to do on your client sites. Yeah, yeah. Do you think, uh, how do you think the Black Hat community has evolved uh, since, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago? Because uh, Black Hat was used a lot and worked for a lot of people um, back then. Yeah, How a lot of the you, guys. You see I... the community since you're uh, you have your own community days, you're training dojo, and have been active in other communities. How do you see people that did black hat in the past maybe are still doing that? They no, can't... dude, dude, a lot of them went legit. <laughs> you know, I think I think Google you really were forced. You were forced to end yeah. legitimately by Google. Yeah, you know, it's really only the very, very good ones that are still out there doing it. Meaning, you know, the very technically inclined, the ones that are really good at it. Those sort of cursory, borderline black hats that were just kind of using script kitty stuff. And they've all gone legit now. <laughs> you know, and they, they moved into that realm. And it's kind of like link builders, you know. Link builders was, you know, you could maybe call that black hat I, again I, I i'm not a big fan of the whole hat discussion but because you know there is gray areas and there's this and yeah, that. Yeah, like, sure. if you're gonna say that any you know black hat is anything against google's uh, guidelines well that puts most of us in there <laughs> yeah, but yeah no but yeah, i no, wasn't I'm talking not... about that i i was yeah. talking about the people that were doing uh i don't know the real yeah. black hat. You know what I mean? A lot of them, a lot of them went legit. I, you know what I mean? I'd say almost, you know, you're talking 10 years ago when Google got really hard on this stuff. I'd say almost about 50% of them went legit. And you know what I mean? It's only the real hardcore technical guys that are really still getting away with that and still using that. And it's there again, you know, if, if you're doing SEO, not for clients, but you're doing it for yourself because you know, you have, you're doing affiliate, making money off affiliate stuff. You know, I guess it's still there because Google still has that problem of a lead time, a lag time, meaning you can churn and burn some sites out there, make some money. And by the time Google catches you, you've made your money. You know, they penalize that site. You throw it out, go get a bunch more rinse and repeat. So churn and burn will still work like that because it's still a bit of a lead time of, you know, probably two, three, four months that you can still go out there and do that stuff and make some money. So it's just about churning sites over and over and over. So it still exists out there. And some of these guys went into negative SEO. You know what I mean? There's no lack of, you know, some of the clients that I have that get start getting hammered by, you know, negative SEO tax with links and stuff like that. That still happens, mm -hmm. you know. Of course, yeah. Matt Katz always told me it's not a thing, but okay. <laughs> well, it's a thing. <laughs> Yeah, I see also uh, on our uh, cognitive SEO customers, people complaining and uh, showing us data uh, from negative SEO, uh, negative at SEO attacks, and uh, some of them correlate with 
rankings drop. Yeah, it's you, it, it's you know you got to be careful and, and vigilant. You know what I mean? Like one of the things our company still does to this day is part of our monthly service is monitoring that kind of stuff. If it's you know through Majestic Ahrefs or like you guys at Cognitive, or if it's uh, you know. Uh, there are a ton of tools. There are a ton of tools out there. Yeah, but you always the best tool is your brain. The best well, that's, tool. Well, that's brain. it. That's always the question. People say, "What's the best tool for SEO?" <laughs> right here, because data is just data. If you can't analyze the data, and if you don't know the questions to ask the data, then you know you're screwed. But yeah, no, you know we had a we had a really neat one that Google didn't even catch. I got a hold of John Mueller and Danny Sullivan about it, um, and they they had gotten into the back end of this site. And they started injecting code um, that was essentially, I was it was a pharma, right? Uh, Viagra, Cialis, all that kind of stuff. And what it was doing was uh, when Google would come along, it would redirect to this sort of PBN, uh, not a PBN, sorry, a CDN that they had serving up this pharma stuff. But if you, a legit user, went to the site, you wouldn't see it. Um, but it was certainly indexed and everything else. And what they had done, they had hidden the code in uh, PNG files image files so when you're looking you know forensically when we went in with our team to the site to try and figure out what was going on you know you're seeing you know such and such dot png so you're thinking well that's not it but when we started doing a file comparison on the wordpress theme and stuff like that we realized these are files and oh, sure enough they had hidden the code in the pngs and this had been there for six months and this site didn't get a penalty or nothing man <laughs> google didn't have a clue it was happening so yeah it was some pretty inventive stuff still going on out there and that's yeah. not even that's not even negative SEO. That's just straight up black hat. And they were using piggybacking on this site to get themselves some links and crap like that. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of our users and readers sometimes ask about personal blogging networks. Uh, do you think uh, they are safe? Is it still worth having them? Um, you know, I got. I always have. You know, that's that ties in for me with the whole SEO ethics thing, and and a lot of people like to say ethics of SEO is to be white hat and this and that. No, my 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 version of ethics is simple. If you're doing something that can put a client site at risk, and you don't tell the client that there's a risk, well, that's where the ethics come in. Um, so Correct. PBNs PBNs fall under that. There's always a risk. You know, there's there's you know people are well, mine's undetectable. This and that. Well, it's undetectable till the day Google finds it. <laughs> And then your client gets penalized and then you screwed something. <laughs> so by and large with our membership, we don't advise them. No, you want to, again, this goes back to the whole, is it a client site or is it your own site? If you're doing it, to, you do whatever you want with your own site. You know, go out and do PBNs, do whatever the heck you want. I really don't care. Um, stuff keywords, do, you know, redirects, do, you know, cloaking. I don't care because that's your site. So if something happens, you're the only one who gets hurt. But when I did forensics, you know what I mean? I'd get clients that that their seo had done this kind of stuff and they come to me like you know i have lost my savings or, or i mortgage my house and i'm losing my house or i can't send my kids to university now that hurts you know i mean i used to have a lot of sleepless nights and so i'm very very against um anything like that because you know then be honest with your client they can't afford a proper content strategy tell them hey we can't compete you know what I mean? You're going to need to find some other way to, to raise some money to, to properly do SEO and have a social strategy aligned with a content strategy aligned with proper technical on-site SEO, etc. You know, I, I don't believe in PBNs for client sites. Again, unless you tell the client, hey, we could do a PBN, but here is the risk. If you get caught, you're going to get penalized and it could take you up to 18 months to fully get everything back. You know what I mean? If the client still signs off and says, hey, go for it, then fine. You've covered your butt. You've advised them of the risk. That's great. But PBNs in general, no, I don't. I don't use them for any of my clients. But my clients tend to be able to afford. They have the budgets in place to do content strategy plus social and so on to get links and to get you know visibility. So I'm not a PBN guy myself. But my advice generally is, is you know it's very risky because it's you know everyone always says oh uh, undetectable <laughs> until the day it gets detected. So. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's all about that ethics thing and, and, and ensuring that you're not putting a client at risk. You know, and if you are, then make sure they fully understand that risk. Yeah. Um, we all know SEO, in the SEO world, patience is the virtue because uh, um, it gets harder and harder to make a modification on your site or do something and see some kind of results in, in Google. Um, people want results, customers want results. Uh, 
can instant gratification or near instant gratification coexist with SEO nowadays? I, I think so. You know, um, it was Dan Thies who once gave me this, you know, sort of concept that I, I now call the art of war. Sun Tzu's The Art of War um, tells you that when, a, when, when you're facing a larger, more powerful opponent, you need to go around from the outside. And, and take them down piece by piece. And what that to me means in SEO terms is now you, 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 you as you wait for those larger terms, those big money terms to, to percolate over six months, 12 months, 18 months, you have to make, you know, your inroads through to longer tail terms and, and, and other terms where you can compete. You know what I mean? So often what you'll do is, is when you're faced with larger competitors that it's going to take you a while to get those rankings, look for those ones that they're not targeting. Take Take reverse engineer their SEO strategy and look for terms that they aren't chasing actively or or terms that you can actually get to quickly or or look at video, look at other things like we've been able how, to how, did, how, how, how can someone identify these gap, gaps? Do you have a technical methodology that you're using? To identify well, it depends on the market. Training, again, it, it depends uh, on the market. You, you, you know, again, if, if you have like rank tracking is a funny thing, like so many SEOs say, oh, you should rank track or rank tracking is dead. You know, what I mean, you have those two camps. We still use rank tracking mechanisms and, and software and tools here, but it's to actually watch query spaces. So we'll load it up with 10 different competitors across different terms, and then we can see where the weaknesses are. You know what I mean? Okay, this guy's ranking 10th, and this guy's, you know. So if there's a bunch of guys that are, you know, ranking number one to five or something on your, your head terms, your big money terms, but you look across those 10 competitors that are the core competitors in your hub, and you see that none of them are really chasing these terms, that's a place you can get in affordably. Those are places you can create content and get into. So literally a rank tracking tool is about the best place to start with that because you can see the ones that they're not chasing. I mean, like, like you know, I have monthly reports with a client the other day because it's the beginning of the month. And I, I saw this one competitor start bouncing up on a certain term that, we, you know, they apparently didn't care about until recently. So I, I can surmise that their STO team identified this as a place they could go. So I was like, okay, well, then maybe we'll go look at this term and see how much it's going to take to get in there. You know, in, and verticals are not a good place too. Like we've been able to, like people look at a query space and if there's no video universal, they think, well, no point doing a video. Problem is, is everyone thinks that. So we've created a video sometimes for a certain keyword, right? Maybe we're on page two, like ranking 16th or something. And we'll create a video for that term and boom, Google just didn't have a video to put there. So all of a sudden within two weeks, now we're sitting number three with a video universal because it pops up because there just wasn't any video to put there before. So sometimes you can look at verticals as well as a good way to get from, you know, page three up to page one. So, you know, there's always, you know, ways yeah. to do that. There was, there's always something that you can, uh, you can, yeah. you just need to be creative. About yeah, it. that's it. And that, you know, that kind of holistic approach helps smaller clients that, that you know, again, like you're saying, it's going to take you, you know, a year to 18 months to get into those big head terms. So you attack from the smaller outside terms where you can and where it's affordable. You know? Okay. What do you think uh, new, the new SEOs that are uh, into the market? that are uh, advising clients and doing SEO for themselves, maybe, uh, do compared to the old SEOs? How do you see these these two? Well, it's it's a lot like you were saying earlier. Just the same with clients is the same with SEOs. There's that instant gratification need. There isn't a lot of patience, you know what I mean, with a lot of the younger and or newer, I don't know, age-wise, but newer SEOs have that instant gratification. You know, it's always like, what's the new method? Because PBNs are on the rise again. You know, like people are talking, you know, 10 years, eight years ago, people were like, oh, forget PBNs, scary. Now it's a thing again, you know what I mean? You, you've got these people that are coming in and, and, and they, you know, they're all oh, PBNs. They're all looking for an angle. They're looking for a way to cheat the system. They're all looking for that shortcut. They're looking for that big red button, which also goes back to what we were talking about with tools. You know, they're always like, what's the best tool? It's like, well, no, it's not the, it's not about a tool. In SEO, you have a question that needs to be answered in your head. And so then you seek out the data, which comes from tools, but you need to start with the hypothesis and you need to start with the question to figure out which tool you need to give you those answers. You know, sometimes it could be cognitive. Sometimes it could be, you know, majestic. Sometimes it could be Google search console. You know, it's, but the problem is, is everyone thinks that they need some tools going to do the job for them, you know, and, and that becomes the problem. 
and, and everyone, a lot of young SEOs are like that right now. You know what I mean? It's it's PBNs or what's the shortcut? What's the fastest way? What's, you know, it's, there's a sense of laziness. You know what I mean? A lot of the older SEOs that I know that are, you know, been at it 15, 20 years, they understand like we, you and I are talking about that they, some terms are going to take time and it's more about the strategy than it is about the immediacy about that, you know, just let me push a big red button and I'll get rankings. And, and they, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's partially, you know, due to how they're selling the, the, their projects, you know, maybe they're not um, talking to new clients, not saying, okay, this is going to be a bit of a pain process. You know, this is going to take some time. You know, maybe they're over promising and under, you know, and under delivering. And so they're under this pressure to always deliver because they, they're, they're taking on, like if I got a client that, you know, that's coming in and they, you know, I'm in the sales process and, and they think that it's going to happen in, in a month or two. And I keep telling them that's not, and they're like, well, I want to, then you just don't sell that project. You say, well, I'm sorry, we can't do business. You know, you can't put yourself under that gun, you know, qualifying your clients is important too. You know? Right. Let's talk about a bit uh, the, the importance of content. How do you see, how do you see content uh, stack up in the... the well, you know, I, I, always tell my, I, always, I always tell my clients that, you know, people type words into Google. <laughs> so, <laughs> Google's really got this thing for words. <laughs> You know, it's like you get to those home pages on an e-commerce site, and there's all these big pictures, and there's like you know one paragraph. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, you know Google Images isn't going to make you money. So yeah, you know, content strategy is everything. You know, if it's again like we talked earlier, if it's part of the strategy of of, of targeting outlier terms and longer tail terms, um, if it's part of a strategy of building links because you want to build viral content or content that'll be popular and get out there. Um, and even if it's if it's activity like you know there's there's you know the qdf which is uh, query deserves freshness to a degree google looks for activity on a site and i mean i don't care if it's an informational site or an e-commerce site or a service related site stagnant sites that don't have new content at least every once in a while how is how is google supposed to know that someone hasn't walked away from this website I mean, how, how many web, like we all know is we're trying to get rid of bad links. You email some site to say, can you take this link down? You don't get a reply because the person who built it's gone. <laughs> you know, they're working at McDonald's now. <laughs> they just never took the site down or whatever. You know, so how is Google supposed to know that a site's not active, that a site's not still alive and vibrant if there isn't new content? You know, we, we, we look at content in a few ways. You know, obviously if it's a, you know, a service or e-commerce related, you know, new products, new service offerings, um, then beyond that, you you know, you've got, you know, what we call evergreen content. So evergreen is sort of that content that stands the test of time. So you keep that off your blog. You keep that in a separate section. That could be FAQs. That could be how to use our product or service kind of stuff. And then you've got a blog. And the blog is sort of more, you know, a, a, a opinions and, and topical and news and things of that more of sort of everyday stuff. So, you know, we, we tend to always divide content up in those two, two kind of groupings. But, but you always want those, you know, those are very important and not, and, and then for the obvious fact that, that you need things to go out and get visibility, forget Google even. I mean, like if you're building a Facebook account or, or Pinterest or whatever, you still need new things to, to keep building those followings in the social realm because there is a world beyond Google, <laughs> you know, you can actually, you know, make money doing business on Facebook and Facebook ads and things of that nature. So you need stuff to always have out there to be alive and current and vibrant, you know. Yeah, I wanted to ask you because a lot of people when they talk about content, talk about blog content. Uh, and uh, in general, blog content is informational content. It's not your money pages. It's not your direct yeah. uh, money keywords. Uh, yeah, but, but you're building e what what Google calls if you if you look at the um, uh, Google Raiders guides that come out every year, it's what they call eat expertise, authority, and trust. Right? Mm -hmm. These are very core concepts that are, that you really want to go towards with with your content again it's like so many people think content is just about getting links or whatever and and no but you got to remember that google has algorithms that look at expertise authority and, and trust and, and by showing your expertise and by showing your authority well authority is more of how many people start to follow you and share your content but it, these are things that google has algorithms for that that will 
you know, benefit your entire site, including your money pages, right? So it's not just about, okay, let's float this out there. Oh, a lot of people see it, but do they go to my money pages? Well, that doesn't matter because if you're establishing that authority and that expertise with Google, those money pages are going to get a boost as well with their rankings by a secondary effect. Okay, but how uh, should people optimize the money, the money pages taking, uh, okay, you, you increase your EAD, you increase the authority of your, uh, of your domain overall with your blog, but still there is optimization to be done uh, regarding the improvement of the rankings for the money, money, money yeah. keywords. Yeah, well, I, I think, well, I think, uh, I think one, of the, one of the positive. most one of the most overlooked metrics um, for technical SEO stuff is internal link ratios. And essentially what internal link ratio is, is, you know, I talked to Matt Cutts one day and, and we were sort of talking about this. And he said, essentially, Dave, he says, you know, to simplify it, he said, when Google looks at a site, the most internally linked page on the, on the site, which is obviously the homepage, but after that, we think of it as you consider this to be the most important page. The least internally linked site uh, page on your site, we consider to be the least important to you because, you know, and again, it's he was trying to simplify it when we were talking, but that's a very overlooked thing. So, you know, there's even a report right in Google Search Console that shows you, you know, internal links. And that's one of the quick wins. Almost every new client we get, that's one of the first things we do is we, we look at their, you know, page mapping of their keywords and, you know, terms. And then we go and look at the internal link ratios to those pages. And if you go and establish, you go and make some changes to that maybe a footer link or maybe some sidebar links or, you know, links within blog posts and stuff like that, that will start to surface it. And again, if you think of page rank and how that works, which is only, you know, one of many metrics, but you know, even that works that way because now you're, you're funneling and you're, you know, passing more page rank internally to that page. So that's going to help lift it up as well. You know, that is one of the more, key elements and obviously you know i mean you can look at your title tags you can look at your you know heading tags and things of that nature but internal yeah. link ratios is something people don't really look at enough you know do you do you, do you still use keyword research and uh, i don't know keyword optimization to to improve uh, rankings to a degree but like i was saying at the beginning um due to the fact that how um google's starting to look at well has been looking at things for quite a while um you know, over focusing on, on an exact match kind of keyword isn't really the issue. It's more of related stuff. You know what I mean? So, you know, if I'm looking at the content of that page, I, I'm looking for um, an ontology of words, of phrases, of concepts. You know, I, I always tell, tell the group with, with the dojo, with the new people, I try to teach them it is the concept of Jaguar. You've got Jaguar the car, you've got Jaguar the animal, you've got Jaguar the, the you know, Apple um, mm -hmm. browser. You've got Jaguar, the football team in America. So for Google, Jaguar, the car, you're going to see words like, you know, tires and engine and performance and this and that. Jaguar, the animal, you're going to see big cat and prey and hunting and tail and claws. And so it's these other outlier terms that support the, the core concept of that page. You know, it's like Google says th things, not strings. You know what I mean? So things is it's a lot about what we call entities, which is a person, place, or thing, and you, you're supporting it. Like, you know, I painted the White House. Now, that's just a simple phrase, but is that, you know, the White House down the street that your buddy owns, or is that the White House in, in Washington, D.C.? The rest of the content on that page is going to support and tell Google what that page is about, the concept of that page. So keywords themselves, sure, you, you've got targets that you want to chase, but it's, you know, you also have to look at the other phrases and concepts and the ontology of words that surrounds that content to really flesh it out for Google. You know what I mean? And that's, again, another area that a lot of these new SEOs with their PBNs and all their crap don't understand these things. So, you know, they're chasing ghosts. <laughs> they're not understanding how a search engine works. And I always joke to my wife that SEOs kill me because, you know, imagine being a web developer who doesn't know HTML. Well, most SEOs have very little knowledge of how a search engine works. They're out there doing something, but they don't study information retrieval. They don't, you know, they don't know how it works and how it evolved. And, you know, once you know that, it's almost intrinsic for a guy like me. You know, I'm from the school of Bill Slosky. I read patents and I, you know, read papers. And 
I have a high knowledge of information retrieval. So when I do my job, I, I think like that. I see a page like that. I see an infrastructure like that. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, maybe that we have this, uh, this cool, the uh, keyword research and the content assistant tool. And uh, for example, I did uh, an experiment um, a few weeks ago and we improved uh, the rankings of one of the pages on our site. And uh, what, what's interesting, with every uh, optimization that uh, we do with the tool and we see our customers do, the number of impressions in Google Search Console, for example, increases because uh, you are recommended uh, topical related terms that you did not use in the original content. And this is another thing that people are not aware of because you're targeting, for example, a specific keyword. Right. But with that specific keywords, there are a multitude of other similar keywords with lower, um, uh, lower, di lower difficulty that you can uh, rank on, on them. And practically in, our, in my experience, uh, with the optimization and adding the uh, topics and keywords that uh, were recommended there, uh, we increased the, the number of impressions from 3,000 to over 10,000. And practically this was done in, uh, with a one hour of uh, content rewriting and uh, a re-indexation that we asked uh, in Google Search Console and uh, the impressions and traffic jumped practically in the next, uh, in the next, uh, in the next day. No, that was the tool. That's the one uh, that you sent me the, the the email about. Yeah, yeah. I'm, okay, I will go play with that after this. Because yeah, so many people have tried. Um, you know, I remember uh, Moz had their um, LDA tool, and it's it's been tried a few times unsuccessfully to to find a tool to to suggest proper uh, supporting concepts for a page. And you know, it, it, you know, someone could pull that off. It's it'd be gold. So obviously you've got something that's working there. So I'll definitely yeah, so go play with it. What what the tool does? It analyzes uh, it analyzes the top rankings in uh, in Google, and uh, right. based on based on that, it finds for cor it correlations. Identifies, correlations uh, terms. It looks for correlations of other terms for the top ranking sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. It's, nice. it's the modified TF-IDF with yeah. their, yep. uh, with uh, other semantic algorithms be behind it. Yeah. As long as you don't say LSA, LSI, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's neat. Yeah, it's, that, that is, again, that's another concept that I don't think a lot of people consider or that there's a lot of uh, tools out there that can accomplish. You know what I mean? And, and that's very important. Again, this is that's what semantic analysis is all about with Google is they're looking for certain supporting concepts and words and terms and phrases you know that that support that and then that's so much of like this whole rank brain thing that that's going to keep fleshing out is you know i mean um they had a word to vec a uh, word to vector um patent that i i did some work on and, and a phrase to vector patent and again that's what it's doing is it's like you know how closely does blue relate to apple in a in a vector graph not very much but how much does green relate to apple in a vector graph or red relate to apple in a vector graph they're very close Right. And so that's part of what rank brains doing is it, it's looking on a in a vector, a term vector graph on on phrases, terms and words that are related to a core concept of a query that comes into Google. Right. And so, yeah, tools like that are very, you know, again, it's been tried and not done well. So <laughs> you know, Moz tried one and threw that in the garbage within a couple months. <laughs> so. Yeah. What do you think are the top three SEO practices that can destroy a website's rankings? Um, well, obviously link building, you know, I mean, bad link building. And again, I, I'm not even a guy who said, I don't even like the term link building. Like, you know, Deborah Mistaller and friends of mine and people that are very, very smart people still use that term. I like the word attracting links, not building links. You know what I mean? I, I, I like to use a combination of smart content, meaning, you know, content that's, you know, going to get some visual eyes on it in, you know, in a combination with, with you know, everything from social media followings that you build um, to, you know, email lists and things like that. You can build to surface content out to people. Um, I, I, I think that is my way of doing things. Obviously, you know, there are other ways to build links that people use. And, you know, I guess citations and stuff like that's okay for local. But link building is obviously the, the, the main danger. Um, 
and from there, to be honest with you, you can literally, um, if you put in uh, Google manual uh, manual actions into like Google, you'll get a list of, I think there's 11 different manual actions that Google has, right? Everyone always thinks of a natural links because that's what we always see, but there's thin content manual actions. You know, that entire list is a scary list, right? So so everything from, you, you can do cloaking by accident. <laughs> you know, people have done that, you know? Um, there's so many ways you can get in trouble it's not funny and it's funny that, that that a lot of people just don't really consider all these different things that google watches so you know really anything in the manual action list um from thin content to you know unnatural links to you know that kind of stuff is probably dangerous i think the, the three big ones would have to be links um probably thin content you know what i mean like there's there's just no and that's a few ways because it's not only are you at risk for a penalty you're also wasting crawl budget you know if you've got a bunch of content on your site that's really useless you know it's not getting links it's not getting you know it's not getting search traffic get rid of it because you're eating up crawl budget you know what i mean for other pages that might be more important for your your business and for google you know just because you got ten thousand pages doesn't mean you have ten thousand pages that are useful so that's that could be a waste and, and get rid of them just throw them in the garbage and redirect it somewhere else not even redirect it because then you gotta what do you think about content pruning that's what i'm talking about yeah i think that's a great idea you know i mean i really do like i don't think that if you know it's a good thing to do quarterly if not at least semi-annually you know go through the site and look for stuff that's not getting traffic that's got no links that that has no value you know what i mean get rid of it you know there's no point in having it it's, it's just it's taking up crawl budget and other things and it's not serving a purpose so and sometimes you can actually take two or three of those pages and put them into one page that might actually be more valuable to Google. You know, you don't always have to throw it in the garbage. Sometimes you can say, okay, well, this is related, this is related, this is related, but they're all kind of thin content. Let's take them all, stick them on one page and see what happens. You know, sometimes that approach can work, you know. But Do you yeah, think I, I, hub, pages, hub pages work? I mean, you take all of these pages that are similar, create another extra page and link in front from that as a hub page. Do you think this is a good strategy? Yeah, I, I think that could work. Again, you got to monitor it. It's all because, you know, Google literally, if you read enough patents and stuff, treats each query space somewhat differently. Like, you know, payday loans is treated different than, than a craft page about, you know, painting or something. You know, you got to mm -hmm. understand, you got to be very um, in tune with your query space, which is going back to the new SEOs thing. Another thing that's not understood. Everyone thinks that SEO is just the same process cookie cutter page over page over page you got to know your query space and because some query spaces in this market are going to be different than this niche and this niche and this niche and that query space you got to get a little more intimate with your query space and and know what what's working and what's not there you know so you you can't just apply the same thing you do like that's a problem with a lot of seo agencies is they hire these people and, and they have this set way of doing things that they apply to every client because you know big agencies get into that because it's more efficient but really you know a boutique shop like mine we're very more intimate and we, we look at each client and each market and each query space differently you know so you know i i think that's something that, that it's a good idea to try you have to have that toolbox so that when you approach a situation you say well you know this has worked in the past let's go try that and if it doesn't work well you don't do it sometimes it will sometimes it won't you know okay how do you usually pitch clients to to win them what do you show them uh, that's unique that uh, makes them become your customers i don't really have that problem um because of my standing and where i've been in the industry um all my stuff comes referral so you know what i mean like um okay you know, yeah everyone comes in my doors already it's like you know i get to just come in and go all right here's what i'm charging you give me some money um, but, but I do mentor a lot of guys and, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, what I try to teach the guys that I've mentored, the younger ones is to, to be, you know, sincere. Don't try to oversell. Don't try to promise the, you know, the world be brutally honest, you know, say, okay, this is the way it is. Because again, we were talking about, um, qualifying clients earlier and, you can't, you know, I know it's the urge for a lot of young guys, you know, they need to make money and they don't have a lot of clients and not high paying clients and, you know, they get desperate and then that's often becomes the problem is you take on that client because you need to pay the bills and they become that pain in the butt that destroys your life because, you know, they're eating up all your time. But I, I think to qualify good clients, you need to be honest. You need to feel them out as much as they're feeling you out. 
you know, you, you can't approach a, a, a new prospective client being desperate. I, it's just a recipe for disaster. You know, so, you know, I, I think for young guys or people I mentor, I, I, I tell them to be honest. You know, I, like I had a guy the other day, he, I, I, I literally, with the guys I mentor, when they're doing sales calls, I will go in on Skype with them and pretend I work with them and stuff and just to help them and listen and, and, and show them. Um, and I do that for free. Um, so, you know, I'll get in there, you know, like this one guy the other day, he's like, well, what do you think, Dave? I charge him a couple hundo. I'm like, I don't know. What do you mean? Do you know anything about the client or his budget or his keywords? Or Nope. <laughs> he wanted to price it before he knew anything. <laughs> I was like, well, you don't know what you're looking at here. So, yeah, it's that process of when you meet them is what are the, what are their expectations? You know what I mean? That's that's managing their expectations as ever. You know, like what are they looking to get? Because some people's expectations could be um, visibility and building authority in their space some is obviously making money some could be you know what, what we call as primary and secondary conversion points you know you might have a primary conversion point of selling shoes but your secondary conversion point might be building an email list right um so you, you never know till you're in there and, and and showing that interest in a client is 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 a huge step you know what i mean being able to go in there and I mean, like you can, you know, run like your tools or something on it, get a few reports before you go into that sales call. So it looks like you care about them. You didn't just walk in and go, all right, what do you want? You know, you, you went in with some stuff that you ran through the you know, cognitive and said, okay, well, I looked at your site before we had this sales call and I, I saw this, I saw that, saw this, you know, show, show that actual interest in them and their business, you know, and, and from there, it's really, are you going to be able to work with this person? You know what I mean? If, if you know, I had, I, I let someone go the other day that, you know, the first meeting we had was like e a little bit abrasive. And I was like, no, this is going to work. So I emailed him back and I said, I don't think we'll be able to work together. Because, you know, if, if there isn't even some sort of personal connection, I think, for me at least, I, I, I you know, are, you're just doing it for the money. And, and that, I, to me, I need that sort of passion to really want to see them succeed, you know? Okay. So <clears throat> let's end this, uh, this, uh, all with uh, a question about Google. Where do you think Google is uh, heading to, and what's the future of search, and what should webmasters be prepared for? Well, I, I, I think at this point we have one. You know, a, a lot of the things will stay relatively the same, and they always have. You know what I mean? From you know optimizing content and you know page rank and title tags and all that kind of stuff. Even mobiles become kind of you know, intuitive for people that are used to mobile, you know, I guess 2008 or nine is when that really started to crawl in. I think voice search is going to be the real challenge now. You know, it's, it's something we, we've had a lot of, you know, internal discussions on at the dojo and we've had some hangouts on it. And it's, it's an interesting area to start to, to try and get your head around this because voice search is, is, is becoming, will, will obviously be the way someday. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the, the, more and more this you know what they call conversational search as well which is kind of tied into it um you know and again that has all its beginnings in hummingbird and things like that and so yeah i think this is going to be one of the harder ones to get our heads around is how do you optimize for voice search and things of that nature um they have what's called google actions as well and uh google actions are for like you know your little for you know querying voice or or the little devices in the home that google has now and you can actually go out and play with these um you know i, I know eric Enga and the guys at stone temple have done a lot of work with it that i've been talking to them about and uh so you can actually did, at this moment go out and, and program into google various actions related to your company and your entity and things so that when people you know like you know what what does stone temple think about title tags and it'll come back and tell you in voice and everything google assistant will come back and talk to you so yeah the google assistant the google voice um all that kind of stuff and obviously a, a harder uh lean on the local and, and mobile and things of that nature Th this is this is really going to be a tough area i think for a lot of seos because they seem to have enough problems just figuring out you know on-site seo <laughs> never mind voice search you know again we have so many seos that just throw throw links at it pbns this and that so i i think this will weed out a lot of people over the next 10 years so yeah i i i think that's one of the more challenging areas that people need at least at this point start to get their heads around is the voice search and how that affects everything so. okay 
Thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, pleasure, man. And uh, looking forward to hear more from uh, from from you in the in the future. Yeah, anytime, man. Anytime. Feel free to hit me up. Okay. Thank you. Bye, bye, everyone.